treated you. Someone else gave me a phrase that was very helpful in describing a certain portion of the late afternoon, early evening as the arsenic hours. Um, <laughs> when you wanted to, you know, either give yourself the arsenic or give someone else, but at that, that point, you know, sort of everything had to, uh, uh, was exhausted at that point in the afternoon. Um, and I think, and I think we're hitting this sort of arsenic hours moment of the conference, right, when you hit the 415 session and people are like, should I do something else before the end? We're also up against what sounds like other fabulous, you know, prototyping sessions. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so I'm a little bit chagrined about that because I know that some of the people at Isabel Stewart Gardner and elsewhere are doing some really incredible work. So I'm Kate Haley Goldman. Um, I do visitor centered planning, strategy, and evaluation. And I've had the fortunate um, time this year and in recent years to be working with both of these gentlemen. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Before we go through this, yes. Mm. Is this on? Testing, testing. Nope. Hi, I'm David McKenzie. I'm Associate Director for Interpretive Resources at the Ford's Theater Society. That means essentially exhibitions and digital history. All right, hey y'all, I'm Chris Graham, and I'm a curator at the American Civil War Museum. So in, we're gonna talk about two very different places where we were doing rapid prototyping and design sprints, um, and sort of the pros and cons of those solutions, what it allowed for, in terms of institutional and organizational growth, um, and where, where we felt like it was appropriate and not appropriate. I think we, we all learned a lot over the cor last course of the year in, um, in planning this forward. So, um, I'm not loving this. Uh, so um, what we discovered is when uh, one of David's colleagues at the boards was talking about prototyping at um, AASLH, the American Association of State and Local History, that um, no one else was using the term prototyping the way she was, right? And then she was suggested to, in fact, write up a blog post, write up a paper or something to describe the Ford's approach to prototyping. Um, and I'm going to let David dig into that a little bit more, but this is, his project is something that we cooked up together um, to, to really look at solving a particular problem. And so I'm asked a lot in the evaluation world to do user testing. Um, and user testing is a catch-all for so many different portions of the design process um, that it, it becomes very difficult at times to figure out exactly what the goal is. We all know that there can be benefits from testing while in development, but these are different types of things. So the top picture up here, we're actually looking at usability of a digital product to just see if we've got bugs going forward, right? Like, can you get through the whole component of it? In the bottom, this is a project um, that Bruce and others were working on, and I was doing some um, some user testing there. We're actually looking at the kids' concepts of data literacy. Do they understand what this bar graph is um, for the science exhibition that we're gonna be working with and can they interpret that data? That's not the interface that this is going to be on at all. This is purely about comprehension and it's early enough that it's comprehension so that we know how to design rather than whether we designed right, right? And so um, it's a very, in some ways, does my idea work for you, portion of user testing. And while it comes out a lot of this human-centered design principles and design thinkings, it is still in some ways a very traditional model of, I've designed something, and now we're going to see if you can work it properly, <clears throat> right? And sometimes there are bugs within that, um, and it's, or whether you can understand the idea properly. Um, and and there's, there's other forms of that. There's certainly nothing wrong with this. We do this all the time because you don't really want to have those products to get out on the floor and not have done usability within this, right? I had a website that we were testing and none of the people could enter the website. You had to do a little script in order to, to enter the website. And you know, user testing of five means that that project had totally failed and we had to go back to the drawing board. And you don't want to end up at that point for deployment. But there are other ways to go about this. 
um, rather than comprehension and usability early on. So what David's going to be talking about is a design sprint piece that we use, where we would do a very um, time-boxed process in terms of trying to solve a very specific problem, right? And as you all know, the, the difficulty within these pieces is not necessarily coming up with a solution. We have solutions a million um, in terms of this. The difficulty is knowing exactly what our problem is. Right? And that we have to, what exactly is it that we are trying to solve? And do, are we using the same words within that? Right? We're trying to increase student engagement. Okay, well, we could spend weeks just talking about those few words of what increasing student engagement <coughs> would actually look like. So I'm going to let David go through this process. I think I do want to say before he gets into that, um, the attributes of the of the outsider leading this, facilitating this. I wasn't really serving as the evaluator. I was more serving as the traffic cop for a lot of the process that Ford was, was going through at that point in time, is that it was um, not just problem oriented, but it was also very cross departmental, right? So this is not their IT department trying to solve a specific problem. This is folks from communications and marketing with education, with visitor services, etc pulled from a selection across the institution. In a particular, we are going to spend a certain amount of time doing this. Um, the other thing that I would say that was very important, that was very different for this, this group, is that we have to have a decider in the room, which I would say Ford's was very uncomfortable with as an organization um, going in, um, is that they are one of those museums that it feels like the meeting should be about consensus, and everybody knows it's not entirely about consensus, right? Like, they're, they, we're not having everybody have equal votes within this. But the idea that I would say to David or to someone else, you are the decider, and we're going to go through these different options, and everybody's going to have their say. And then the person with the actual fiscal authority, or whatever else that is, is going to make a decision, change the room quite a bit. And you would think that that would make it more hierarchical. And I don't think it necessarily did, but we will, um, within that, it gave um, a sense that you knew you, the team had reached a decision, we gathered a certain momentum, and the opportunities were clear within that. And that's part of the, the, the design sprint baked in process. The other types of projects if you, um, that I have worked on in the last year are co-created projects. And I have to say, the vast majority of the projects that I have been worked on that have been called co-created, um, we used it as a buzzword. Right, and so I'm on two projects now where they are co-created not as a buzzword, and it is really, really difficult to see that kind of authority and control, even writing the grant. So one of the grants that we wrote, we said, we actually don't know what the outcomes are yet because we haven't met enough with the community to hear what they think the outcomes will be. So this is a project where we were working with um, AAAS and the National Park Service on developing uh, AR um, for this particular group. It was a, a set of um, teenagers and millennials of color, and we did a, quite a bit of work with them. But I would have to say that it wasn't really co-created in some ways. We come with them with, we've decided to build this, and you're gonna give us lots of rich feedback about what types of experiences you want, but the framework, the tools, the methodology were all still a dominant cultural imposed, right? We, you know, the team came and said, we want this kind of technology and we want this kind of outcome. And these guys were great and told us, here's how you can get to that outcome and exactly how interested I'll be in your outcomes, right? Um, and they said, oh, well, also, by the way, these are our outcomes. These are the types of things that we want to get out of experiences like this. And, and my team had to be like, oh, come with your own goals. And while they had worked themselves through all of this, it was still a very different prototyping process in terms of balancing out that authority and power. So I'm now going to let David describe in depth, and then Chris will as well, our experiences. And then we'll debrief and hopefully hear a few of yours. Right. Well, uh, thank you, Kate. Um, I'm also happy to see that there is somebody tweeting in the room. Much appreciated, <laughs> since I'm often that person. and. Uh, talking with one of the people who was in 
Why don't be two other UX and prototyping sessions at the same time? We were like, let's encourage everyone to tweet so that way there can be some dialogue among the sessions. So yeah, so um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm David McKenzie. I'm um, Associate Director for Interpretive Resources at the Ford's Theatre Society in DC. So um, yeah, we, we did a very particular type of prototyping where we did prototyping sprints. So really, you know, this was really for the objective of student engagement. Now, as Kate said, how to define that term? Good question. But I think doing this process actually helped us to get toward maybe not a full definition of that term, but more of a um, we know it when we see it type of definition of that term. So you could say my alternative title will be how we went from a mobile app to cardboard cards and flip doors. So we'll leave you with that little uh, cliffhanger there. So um, just a bit, of, a bit about us. Um, so Ford's Theater, how many of you have heard of Ford's Theater? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, site of President Lincoln's assassination, um, became a federal office building after that, um, and uh, totally gutted. But since 1893, there was a Lincoln Museum on the site that was really devoted to Lincoln's life. Um, and a lot of that collection for the Lincoln Museum became federal property in 1926 and is still part of the National Park Service collection. So um, you know, very much Lincoln emphasis versus Lincoln assassination emphasis. Um, the historic theater space wasn't restored until 1968. It's operated by a joint partnership between the National Park Service and the Ford's Theater Society. Ford's Theater Society is my employer. It's actually originally the um, theatrical production company that has since morphed into a Park Service partner organization. So a relationship isn't always clear cut, um, especially when you're planning an exhibit together. Um, it's really complicated. And then um, Ford's Theater gets about 650,000 visitors annually, and of those, about 235,000 are students and school groups, especially in the spring. We usually have to add about five extra minutes to getting to work for just cutting through the lines of students to get into the office in the spring. So um, with that, with those numbers, you would think that maybe a core exhibition would be um, friendly to uh, students. Well, the core exhibition was done by a presidential historian in 2009 and is kind of a Lincoln Presidency 101. So, um, yeah, so yeah, it, it is really, um, it is very much like you see here, the wall of Union generals from the Civil War. So part of my sarcasm here, I was not part of the society at the time, and I will disown any comments I say there, but um, yeah, everybody is kind of relieved. So initially, what we were looking to do was to um, engage you know, students in this, thinking that previously the ex exhibition space had been on 20-year cycles. So we, think, we thought we had another 10 years that we were stuck with this thing. And uh, going to have, you know, pump millions of fifth to eighth graders through it in that time. So we thought mobile will be the way to go. This was like 2016, mobile's the way to go. Well, um, we got a grant from IMLS, thank you IMLS, to do a student mobile solution where we said that the object of it was student engagement. Um, started going through it with Kate as our evaluator. Um, started to quickly find a lot of issues where uh, mobile pickup rates are very low. Um, in fact, we could probably hire a few tour guides and give guided tours that would be more engaging than something on mobile to the same number of students that we would reach with something mobile. Um, but also then we, uh, we got in the very fortunate position where Park Service submitted and got money to redo that core exhibition 10 years sooner than expected. So sweet, except the one, the one issue is that we still have that pending IMLS grant. <laughs> so um, working with Kate, we first figured out, um, we talked with IMLS and thankfully they were very, um, they were very <coughs> flexible. And it, it took a little while, um, what it sounds like a lot of internal decision making um, but uh, it basically, we were able to say that we had the same objective in mind, which was student engagement in this space. But you know, between having done the work to realize that that initial plan to fulfill that objective wouldn't work, and then the change in underlying circumstances of we'd be building something mobile for a space that would be totally gone in two to three years, um, we were able to pivot the project instead to, um, to prototyping sprints. So we were working with Kate, um, 
happened that my boss had taken a human-centered design course, specifically focused on prototyping the year before. So uh, hint to everybody, if you want to get your institution involved in human-centered design, have your boss take a course. Um, in this case, she took the course on her own, and then was like, David, we need to do this. So um, we worked with Kate to really look at what could we do to engage students in that space. So um, Kate developed a series of six week long prototyping sprints. We also pivoted to um, using some of that funds for, for digital signage, finding that wayfinding is a big problem on our site and even expectations of what you're going to do on our site. So talk about the prototyping sprints part. The goal, uh, eventually we came to a goal for this. That was the goal for all six week long prototyping sprints where we would rapidly prototype a short-term, low-cost intervention in the core exhibition to engage students. Now, we used a how might we um, framework for this. So the big question was, how might we increase the visitor's sense of, relevant of the relevance of the content? So that was really kind of the, the yardstick that we were measuring against. What I have here on the right is um, the wall of <coughs> ideas that um, on a big whiteboard, Kate was like, order me, order me a whiteboard before our next uh, sprint. And literally, I had to, it came in that morning and um, had set it up and then we had our meeting. So uh, you know, people, we came up with all of these ideas and started to prioritize them. And this wound up being really useful for future sessions as well. So what does a prototyping sprint, a design sprint look like? Uh, it's a super intensive process. As Kate said, we had people from all across the organization, at least from the society. We had some Park Service folks involved as well. Day one, we hold a brainstorming session with everybody. That was where we also had to get a decider. Um, and you know, basically, by the end, of, the goal was that by the end of it, we would have come up with some, you know, some idea that we wanted to test that would meet that that goal of um, in, you know, increasing relevance, engaging students, and with short term and low cost. Short term in the sense that something we would have up for the next two to three years before we completely got the exhibition space and have the new one up. Secondary goal was that this could also provide ideas for what we would do in the new exhibition. So then um, days two and three were essentially to build it. So this meant that you know we had to throw a, a away any of our institutional biases toward perfection, which we tend to have, be an institution that loves to have everything super polished before it goes out to the public. So um, we had, like, in this case, it's uh, when we decided to do historical figures standing in the street, it's literally taking a few stand-up figures that we already have and uh, putting, uh, putting black paper over them and making little quotes that went on them. So, you know, very basic stuff. Day four was testing on site with audiences. So this is where we would have all, all hands on deck. We'd all have different roles. Some of us would be um, observers. Um, Kate rotated us at first until she realized what we were good at. And um, in fact, this morning I went to a session on interviewing because after a couple of times, Kate realized that um, I wasn't so good at this. <laughs> so uh, I was prohibited from interviewing again. And you were promoted to observation. <laughs> <laughs> Which you're really good at. <laughs> promoted. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, yeah, we had others who yeah, were really good at going out and talking to the groups and saying, hey, we're testing out ideas today. You know, would you be interested in taking part? And, um, you know, other people who were at the very end conducting interviews. If I could just break in, David. So the key thing, I think, for me and, and the team was that when they say day one through five, that means on Monday we brainstorm, on Tuesday we build it, on Wednesday we hopefully are done building it, on Thursday we collected data, and on Friday we debriefed, right? So this is not like day one this week, day two next week. This is like we spend the week so that when we're building, we often had these work sessions where, you know, you got to be done because tomorrow at 10 a.m. we have the student group coming out, right? And so this is as good as it's going to get for the idea. And really, we know the idea down to the core sense of it each time so that we could get to the floor and, and think things through. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, in these very, very intense weeks, um, we wound up going through 
to have six different ideas. So first time was one of the, our big thorny issues is that at our historic site, a lot of a lot of the event happened in the street between Ford's Theater and the Peterson House. Now it's a regular Washington City street with a lot of traffic going down it. Um, I mean, I was looking at historic site reports from the 60s that were like, we really need to close down that street and make it pedestrian only. Um, hasn't happened for 50 years. So uh, kind of doubtful it will happen. But you know, we were trying to think of you know, some ways to activate that space. So um, we did these, they're kind of, it's kind of hard to see on the left, but it's a silhouette of a person. There are people standing out in the street the night of the Lincoln assassination waiting for news about what was, what was happening. Um, so we put little figures out, where, or life-size figures, silhouettes, um, with quotes from actual people. And then on the other side of the street, we put a couple of signs, one of them showing what it was like that night in 1865 from an actual eyewitness painting. And uh, then the other one was showing what it was like in 2015 for the 150th anniversary when we had about the same number of people come out in the streets for a candlelight vigil. So talking about like who would, you know, who would be a leader that you would come out for, or who would be a famous person <coughs> that you would come out into the streets to mourn. So um, we tested this on a cold, luckily not too cold December day. And uh, you know, we, we learned a lot just by doing that. And we learned that um, one side of the street, people are more concerned with their directions of getting to the other side of the street and weren't ready for an interpretive intervention. Once people got to the side of the street with the Peterson house, they were ready for something like this, especially when they have to stand in line. So you know, we kind of banked some of those lessons um, proved to be super helpful in the long run and I think will be helpful in our future planning. The second week was bringing voices into the exhibition. And I mentioned this exhibition was done by a presidential historian. So we were trying to bring actual people's voices. This was an idea that had come up time and time again. Um, so we, we literally like, we came up with a few different voices that we wanted to bring into the exhibition to bring you know, both ordinary and extraordinary people. So like this example right here, Frederick Douglass. Um, part of the point here was that interpretively, the exhibit focuses very much on Lincoln, when reality, you know, it wasn't just Lincoln, the emancipator handing down emancipation, but really many people fighting for their own freedom. So bringing, bringing in that point with, um, you know, lines from Frederick Douglass, literally just different staff members recorded for each person. We put it on an iPad, put the iPad on a music stand. For accessibility, we also had a transcript. This kind of worked so-so. Um, I mean, part of it was the logistics of using an iPad. Like we did, we only did as many as we had iPads. So that was our one of our big constraints. Also, we didn't have separate sets of speakers, and it can get very noisy when there are student groups down there. So yeah, this. I mean, I think you know, I think we learned some of the even some of the technical considerations that we would have to for putting audio in this space that really is already too heavily audio programmed because it was open just before um, directional speakers came out. So certainly the personal voices really, the visitors really responded to hearing, hearing the voices. So that, that was something that we took, we took away as well as, yeah, having, having that personal, and I think that really influenced what we did next. So um, the next one was, uh, Going, being a little provocative and really thinking about relevance. It was looking at the choices that Lincoln made as president. We have a lot of debates around this. Um, so, in fact, I think that this one was, I think in part, wound up the way it did because Kate was sick that day. And so uh, we wound up leading it and I think went probably a little too far, I would say, um, in try, be, trying to be maybe over, overly provocative of Statement is essentially, would you support a president who, um, you know, suspends people's right to uh, have a trial when they are arrested, or um, allows non-citizens to serve in the military? And they were trying to put things that were Lincoln's decisions into as modern of terms as possible. It was essentially they give you a ballot, and you go around, and so like you only have that question you kind of answer beforehand, like would I support a president who did that? And then you lift up the flip door and be like, oh wait, 
Lincoln did that, and here was his justification. What wound up being interesting was one thing, there was a kind of sense of betrayal. You know, we're talking people, with people from the Coalition of Sites of Conscience after this who thought it was almost too gotcha. Like, oh, you think that you support, well, Lincoln did that. What we also found in the interviews, interestingly, was that um, people, like especially students, would, be, would start to then justify. Like, oh, well, Lincoln did this, so it must be okay. Also, we did have one group say, no, we think you're talking about our current president. This is a very conservative group, and we will not participate in this activity. So, I mean, it, it wound up being uh, very eye-opening. Um, I, I think in the long run, too, it did help some of the staff be less afraid of being relevant like not you know, so relevant in the you know, gotcha, bang you over the head way, but realizing that even if we don't make those connections explicitly to present day times, visitors always will. So, um, so that we kind of, you know, we, we took some from it and then you know, really kind of like, okay, yeah, this is going to really help also inform the uh, interpretive plan that Kate is finishing at the moment. So, so we did that as a separate project right after this. Um, so then the next time, we, um, we kind of combined really a couple of the different ideas that we had been doing before as far as delivery mechanisms and doing um, historical figures cards. So these were essentially to, um, um, essentially to personalize the story a bit more in the way that that audio experiment had. And the idea was that when you enter, you'd be given a random card. And the card would be a historical figure. So we picked a few early on, um, we wound up tweaking them later on. Um, so Julia Taft, who was a teenager who interacted with the Lincolns. Um, Elizabeth Keckley, a formerly enslaved woman who became Mary Lincoln's dressmaker and confidant. So really fascinating person. Um, James Tanner, who was a disabled veteran who lived down the street from the Peterson house and on the night of Lincoln's assassination was brought in to take notes of the interrogations. Um, and then William Seward, Secretary of State, were, these were the first ones. And essentially each person would then be, would be given, or each student, we tested this specifically with student groups, given a card, they walk through the exhibit and they look for flip doors with that person and they find out where that, per it's a chronological exhibit right now, so they find out you know, kind of what was happening with that, per that individual person during this period. So um, from this, you know, this, this one seemed like a, a pretty decent winner. Um, students did report um, when we interviewed at the end that they thought this was really interesting. They started to really you know, see their figures a bit more, but it also depended on who it was. Like William Seward, the Secretary of State, was a little harder for them to to empathize with. But it did help to give a, a bit of that personal touch. And also the flip doors added a little bit of interactivity. So, you know, something like you were, just that simple thing, you were uncovering something. So, based on this, when the time came around again, you know, the kind of amazing part was that this is something many of us had talked about for years, and it actually many of us had kind of dismissed <coughs> in our heads as being too logistically difficult or, oh no, no, that's kind of a crazy idea. Our web manager was the person who brought this up in the meeting. And we're like, okay, yeah, let's try this this one time. And then it was like, oh, wait, this might actually work. So the next two times when we realized, okay, we've got two sprints left. Do we want to try another idea or do we want to use this to iterate a little further? So we chose to iterate a little further. Uh, we made some changes each time in the characters. So, for example, instead of uh, William Seward, the 50-something-year-old rich white man Secretary of State, we instead brought in his daughter Fanny, who kept quite a diary during the Civil War. Um, brought in one of the Lincoln kids. A lot of kids said that, hey, we want to see you know, more people our age. So, um, we also wound up bringing in the daughter of Mary Surratt, who was one of the conspirators. So kind of also to give an idea through these personal voices of you know, these, these broad abstract issues that we are talking about <coughs> in, the, in the museum space. 
And we even, um, even at one point put, okay, kind of where was everybody on April 14th, 1865, the Lincoln assassination? So both of these times we tweaked a bit, and we tweaked each time based on what we had learned, but we really found, okay, maybe we've hit on a winner. So this idea that had been you know, previously just kind of on the margins, kind of dismissed, suddenly became, hey, let's actually maybe try this. So that's actually what we are doing now. I'm currently getting quotes for building, you know, for printing these cards and building some semi-permanent, say semi-permanent sense of, you know, really expected to last two or three years, but with a million and a half visitors in that time, in the, uh, in the exhibition space and figuring out where to add them in the very dense exhibition space. But you know, we, we may actually give this a try for the next two to three years. So you know, for us, you know, that, this, this process, it was super intense. Um, I mean, it was very exhausting over a short time period. Kate, yeah, Kate and I like to quote um, my colleague Alex. Um, she said at the, at, at the debrief for the final sprint, she was like, that was really great, and I'm so glad that this is over. <laughs> so, yeah, I kind of felt the same way, especially being kind of the project manager who had to, uh, every week of Sunday nights, you're like, oh my God, okay, doing this again this week, okay, how's it going to go? Um, but, you know, it did give us the time to really do rapid testing of ideas. Um, it also really created new mindsets among the staff. I think there you know, in the time since, one of the big differences I've seen is there's a lot more of a, you know what, let's give this a try and see how it works, rather than let's think this thing to death and, death and come up with a very shiny, polished product that then we really can't tweak or that we just say it's done and that's it. And I get defensive about it when it's critiqued. Do you mind if I add to that in terms of, uh, we had people that they were they were actively concerned would be obstructors in some ways. Very lovely staff and it was like, no, you, you can't try this in. Uh, but I think the, the time boxing of it, the we're just going to put some paper out or some iPads out for a day or so, um, those individuals became great advocates mm -hmm. and ideators because it didn't feel as long or as, as stressful, right? We're going to tape something up in the museum just for this one day. Um, and they ended up coming up with wildly unorthodox ideas uh -huh. that we wouldn't have expected. That I think if we'd been prototyping over the series of months instead of over a week, I would have not been able to get them to do that. Um, that, that was very different. It, it, was kind of, yeah, it was kind of amazing. Like Some of our most like, rigid, like step A, step B, step C people were coming up with these wild, crazy ideas. So, yeah, so then also, um, you know, I think it really did increase staff bonding, too. I mean, we really, you know, a lot of us, we were forced to work together. I mean, even uh, the uh, visitor services manager discovered that her fiance was the favorite professor of um, the um, digital project manager, <laughs> just as we were, when we were standing, sitting there talking together while we were working on something. So, so also, yeah, it really did force us to get over our need for perfection. Um, that said, Sprints might not always be the way to implement long-term solutions. You know, the, this, we only test it up to a point. So, you know, there's a lot that we still really have to figure out for actually implementing this and making it happen, um, especially in terms of planning budgets, for that matter. Um, it also doesn't help, like, you come up with an idea and you're like, okay, this works great. Oh, and we've already gotten next year's budget approved. Um, so, yeah. We are right now trying to cobble together some money to actually build this. And then um, it, you know, at the same time, it, one of the things we are really exploring now is we are launching into an exhibition design process. Like I've been working with the Park Service on the scope of work, and we are trying to figure out, and it's one of the main reasons I'm at this conference, so anybody who has advice, please let me know. Um, talked with some folks this morning about just you know, incorporating more prototyping and generally human-centered design processes into what is a very linear, architecturally based exhibition design process. So that's kind of where we are now. And now we'll hand it over to Chris for, for their project. And we'll have some time for questions at the end too. How y'all doing? Again, how you doing? <laughs> All right. Thanks for uh, joining us in the arsenic hour. 
And thanks for introducing me to that term. Um, I'm going to try to do my part in uh, moving this along by, I, I know it's not cool to read from scripts anymore at good conferences, but I've got some notes and I'm going to lean on them a little hard because uh, you don't want me speaking extemporaneously. It'll really drag it out. So anyways, um, again, my name is Chris Graham and I'm a curator at the American Civil War <coughs> Museum in Richmond, Virginia. And <coughs> I feel like this is a uh, confessional title. I prototype to entirely to find out what I'm thinking. And um, if you're at all familiar with that phrase, I, I'll cop to stealing it almost word for word from Joan Didion. Um, I want to give you a little background on, on our institution, the American Civil War Museum. Uh, again, we're in Richmond, Virginia, and we are the currently the result of a merger between two separate uh, museum institutions that have lived in Richmond for a long time. Um, one is the Museum of the Confederacy, founded in 1896, and the other is the American Civil War Center, founded in 2006. The merger between the two institutions was um, consummated in 2014, and we are currently uh, building a new 28,000 square foot facility uh, at the historic Tredegar location down in Richmond on the James River that will open sometime next spring. I don't know if we even know yet, but for real. Um, but in the process, um, you know, we're in the process of bringing two institutions together. We're trying to update some, uh, bring in some new best practices uh, institutional culture-wise. Um, we do not have a history of um, doing prototyping um, in our museum, and certainly uh, no any kind of uh, visitor center development processes in our museum. So this is all new and uh, a learning process for us. Um, just a little bit about our audience and uh, my project. Um, Kate asked me to say something about the our audience and get it off in a in a couple of couple of sentences. Um, we have a we have a standard traditional audience at our old school history museum. It trends older, lighter, middle class, people with an affinity for uh, the subject matter that we have, um, and people that are not from Richmond, usually, uh, which is the opposite of the population of Richmond, Virginia today, which is younger, extremely diverse, uh, very socially and culturally progressive, and uh, many people who would never think about going to a Civil War museum because you know that's got baggage, um, and so the idea that the idea that we have an audience and we want an audience kind of shaped, and, and we want an audience that aren't going to come to us kind of shaped what I was thinking on on this project. Um, my group in the museum is funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and um, they've got a long term interest in uh, liberal arts in public spaces, and and so long story short. Um, what I'm doing at the museum is turning recently completed dissertations on the American Civil War into exhibits and projects in our space. So we want to get the best new scholarship out uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and our current project is, uh, we're calling Southern Ambitions, and it's an examination of it, looking at the Civil War experience from an international perspective, and particularly focusing on the Confederate experience and the city of Richmond um, in that. <laughs> and uh, one final uh, note about our project is is this is different from uh, David's situation in that uh, work, the Mellon team is kind of a closed cell within the museum. Um, I've got me, and I'll cop to uh, being a historian, uh, coming from the historian world, and I heard your shading of the presidential historian, and <laughs> he's right. Um, <laughs> and I'm working with a postdoctoral fellow, the person who wrote the dissertation, and we've got two uh, graduate research assistants who come out of history departments. And so we are really tightly historian. And that helps us a lot because we, we're on the same page a lot of times. Um, but it doesn't help us a lot because we don't really need to, um, to kind of get other, par other departments in the museum on board with our project or our vision. Um, so that, that kind of enters into our, our takeaways as well. Um, so supporting the Southern Ambitions um, exhibit project, we wanted to put something out on the uh, landscape of Richmond, Virginia. And I know that 
uh, David's kind of going out onto the street between his two properties. We're trying to get all over the city of Richmond. And so the idea is to place an invitation to an activity in front of people who are not looking for it um, and get them to do it. And so the people we're trying to get in front of is that uh, young, diverse, uh, culturally and socially progressive uh, population in, in Richmond. And, um, and so we created this thing called the RVA Global Tour. And RVA is the uh, abbreviation for Richmond that's used quite frequently there. And the RVA Global Tour uses physical installations. Um, we're calling them engagement points, which essentially turned out to be posters. Um, and a website to tell stories about Civil War era Richmond's international connections and connect users to contemporary sites of international culture in Richmond today. And the user path is, is generally um, encounter the poster, uh, be attracted by the poster, go to the website that the poster directs you to, discover there's an activity, um, perform that activity, which is essentially find two posters, um, take two selfies, come down to the museum for uh, <coughs> discounts and uh, free prizes. So, um, and, and so one of the, uh, and so we uh, are trying to tell, I think, 13 different stories and uh, ultimately 26 different locations around town that we want to install these things. Um, what this is not is a uh, guided, as a guided tour, a self-guided tour, an app. Because one of the assumptions that we're making is we want as low as possible a barrier to entry as possible, realizing that no one's going to bump into a poster and download an app to take a tour or to do an activity. Um, and so uh, low barriers for entry, um, strong attraction power, and uh, but otherwise we have no real way of predicting how people will um, engage with this or behave as they move along the, the, the visitor path that we're defining. Uh, we're, that we're defining for them. Um, and of course, and also we have no budget for this particular project, so it's got to be very, very cheap, uh, very, very inexpensive. Um, okay, so, and this has been ad hoc the whole way, and uh, you'll see I've got phase one, round one, phase one, round two. Those are kind of uh, retroactive um, applying those titles to different iterations that we've, we, we've made over time to this. So. Um, the first thing we did was create cards that we wanted to leave out. We anticipated that a lot of the locations we're using are restaurants and cafes and other places where people will congregate and sit. And so we're using, we started out using cards and we wanted to use a little unconventional uh, graphic look and believe me, for a Civil War Museum, that is unconventional graphic look. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, see if there's any interest in the stories. Um, and see if, they, if, the, if the potential user can discern an activity and um, go to the website uh, for this. And on this version, this card, um, we using a bit.ly link to get to the website. And the website is southernambitions. Is it com or org? Southernambitions.org, thank you. Um, and, uh, and on the backs of the cards, we had some survey questions. And we, uh, we tested these at some of the museum's history happy hours and other speaker programs that we do. And we also corralled um, a number of uh, VCU students and VUU students to also help us out and give us some uh, feedback on this project. And so our discovery on this level was that there's general interest in the story. People would say, oh, I didn't know this about Egypt or India or Brazil at the time of the American Civil War. Wow, tell me more, uh, which is great. You wanna, that's good feedback. But we we're also discovering that no one really realized that there was an activity here, and no one went to the website. Um, and so that is becoming a, a problem. Um, and so we revamped the look of these things. We made table tents, um, uh, increased the, uh, the, the graphic look of the, uh, of the table tent, and tested these out at further history happy hours, and also at uh, Chef Mamusu's uh, Liberian restaurant on Main Street in Richmond. And um, we were more intentional about pointing out that there is a thing to do, and you do it one, two, three. You go to the website, 
take two selfies, come to the museum. And so we have different versions of that on this uh, with the uh, graphic indicators using the QR code at this point and, um, and the kind of one, two, three step, kind of being real, really articulating that do these things and you're good. Um, and again, we discovered that the, uh, um, there was a general interest, there was a great interest in the look of these uh, things, um, still an interest in the stories, um, an increased interest in the act, excuse me, increased awareness that there's an activity being offered, but still no one's going to the website. Uh, no one reported going to the website for this. And we didn't observe anyone uh, going to the website or using the QR code. The third version, the third iteration of the engagement posters, um, we took off tables and put on walls. And so we created uh, uh, posters, uh, the largest you can print out on a, on a printing machine. Um, and, uh, and we have uh, uh, striking faces, um, uh, quip, uh, a first person quote that's kind of a quip, and then foregrounding the uh, existence of the activity and the uh, um, here's how you get to the website to do this. And we tested this out in the wild as well in the James River Park system on Browns Island. Um, and at one of the beer gardens we held at the, at the, uh, on the front porch of the museum essentially. And uh, people were, people, you know, we, we can see it notching up. People are getting more interested in engaging with these things, stopping as they're walking by, looking at them. And we witnessed people uh, hitting the, Q two people, I don't want to oversell it, <laughs> two people um, hitting the QR code. And uh, one of those actually went to the uh, front desk to collect an incentive. Um, didn't get that we wanted them to get two selfies, but still, someone was using the QR code. And that was a great, uh, that kind of launched us into uh, what I'm calling the uh, <clears throat> phase two, in which we deployed these posters um, at many of our partners around town. So some of these are inside, some of these are outside, in parks, on the street, in windows, um, on bathroom doors. The one on the bathroom door has been the one that's been hit the most out of all of them <laughs> <laughs> so far in a Penny Lane pub. Um, and, uh, and so we are, uh, we, are currently, uh, we are currently running this prototype. Uh, one of these is in the, uh, the Capitol Waffle Shop. Uh, which is the location of the Brazilian consulate um, during the Civil War period. Um, and so, and we're finding our, the uh, microsite analytics are telling us that people are actually using the QR code and getting to the individual pages um, using them. And uh, I think we have, we had uh, about two weeks ago, we had uh, 68 uh, unique visitors for the previous four weeks, uh, which was a lot more than I anticipated uh, having. Um, it's been more difficult um, tracking and observing people using these because we've got 13 of them. It, we've got them out at 13 locations now, and I can sit in one location all day. I'm not going to see any single person engage with the thing, let alone uh, hitting the QR code with it. And so, um, and so, you know, for a uh, human-centered design thing, we really lost the humans the further out we got um, along the way. Uh, but we know people are using it, um, and certainly one of the uh, kind of one of the logistical problems is that we put it in places where people congregate, and people sit in front of them, and no one else can see them. So you see uh, Don Pedro sitting down there at the bottom right corner behind that guy's left shoulder is one of our posters. And I walked by this location on uh, Monday, and uh, Don Pedro had slipped down below the table and uh, <laughs> obscured the QR code. So I'm gonna go fix that um, on Saturday. So, um, and, and uh, the, the one for China in James River Park keeps disappearing. Um, and I think it's the people that are doing special events in the park system. Um, anyway, so the, uh, um, some benefits and challenges of this kind of uh, ad hoc prototype. Um, what you'll notice is that this is not kind of a formally constructed uh, sprint process that David and Katie talked about. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, we meet, you know, we have met um, every day for, uh, you know, what, excuse me, um, you know, a day or two days a week uh, to work on this project and other parts of the Southern Ambitions uh, project. And, you know, we change things every time we meet. We're not bringing cross-departmental personnel together to have an intense week's worth of work, which I kind of wish we 
have been able to, but um, have been able to do that. But we do have still, again, strong uh, internal team cohesion. Um, but we have been uh, inspired by uh, the the, the uh, uh, design sprint process in that, uh, for one, it kind of breaks. It really. Uh, uh, I, I like the way that it, it kind of uh, breaks the um, kind of curatorial or historian mindset that, that all four of us historians uh, came to this with. Um, and maybe, I don't know if you noticed this, but in, from that first card to the last, the actual historical text and material on it kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now it's a, a, a pithy, snarky uh, third person quote that, uh, that is the text. So, um, and I, it's better that way. Um, and also, uh, um, you know, just as I've learned more about the sprint design process, it's, um, it's enabled me to be okay with, um, you know, every couple of weeks coming in and going, this isn't good. This is not working the way I'm going. I'm not seeing the results I want to see. It is okay to stop and rethink this and turn this around. Um, and so that's, uh, just, just knowing that I had, I didn't have to create something sharp out of the box and uh, um, produce it and get it out there um, has 